Good morning. Welcome to the Bible study on Esther. Election Day is finally here, so I hope we're all continuing to pray. As we've heard over and over again, this election is extremely important because it is going to determine the direction in which our country will go. So let's pray that the men and women of God's choice will be elected on a national, state, and local level. Those who follow the principles and values laid out in the Bible. And let's continue to pray about the pandemic. The numbers continue to rise every day. Some of you may have been affected by it or you have loved ones who've been affected. So we need to pray for a vaccine so that this virus can come to an end. So let's begin prayer now. And Father, how we do praise you for your goodness, your love towards us. We praise you for your mercies that are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness to us as individuals as well as a nation. We praise you that nothing is impossible with you. Nothing is too hard for you. We praise you that you are sovereign in control of all things. So we do pray for your mercy on our nation, Father. We pray that the men and women of your choice will be elected, those who follow the principles and values laid out in your word. And we pray about this pandemic. We pray for those who are ill, that you would heal them, we pray for those who've lost loved ones that you would comfort them. And we pray for wisdom for those who's working on a virus, a, vi a vaccine, so that this pandemic can be controlled and brought to an end. And Father, we praise you for the power of your word, the power to change lives. We thank you for this Bible study and we pray that you would bless it. We pray that you'd open our eyes to the truths that you have for us. And as always, we ask that you would apply them to our lives so that we'd be the men and women you want us to be. And we pray it all in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's open your workbooks to chapter nine. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the work victory, the triumph of the Jews. In chapter nine, we have a description of the battle that took place between the Jews and their enemies. So question one, who got the upper hand? Verse one says, on the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. You remember that under Haman's edict, this was the same day that the Jews had been targeted to be annihilated. But under the new edict written by Mordecai, the Jews have been given the permission to defend themselves. So 1b, on this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. They assembled in their cities and all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those seeking their destruction and God gave them the victory. So question two, what was the attitude of others towards the Jews? Verse two, no one could stand against them because the people of all the nationalities were afraid of them. Question three, why did all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the kings and ministers help the Jews? Verse three, all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces and he became more and more powerful. So God had blessed Mordecai repeatedly. He's now the second most powerful man in the provinces. Question four, Haman's evil plot resulted in what consequences to his family? Verse five, the Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them. And they did what they pleased to those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. They also killed 
Harsandata, Dalphon, Aspatha, Paratha, Adaliah, Aridatha, Parmasta, Arisia, Aridia, and Bezestha, the ten sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. So here again we see the sad consequences of evil. Often those closest to us are hurt by the evil that we do. Haman himself paid for the evil he did, but it went much further than that. His family suffered as a consequence also. All ten of his sons were killed in the battle. The battle that was designed to destroy the enemy, the Jews, destroyed his family instead. Now what was God's promise in Deuteronomy 25, 17 through 19? Moses said, Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and cut off all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. When the Lord your God gives you rest from all the enemies around you in the land he has given you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. So the Israelites were told that they would blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So the action described in chapter 9 fulfilled that promise which God had made Moses. We refer to that passage in Deuteronomy in Lesson 3 when we were speaking of Haman's ancestor as an Amalekite. We also refer to the passage in Exodus chapter 17 verses 8 through 16 describing the battle between the Amalekites and the Israelites. You remember that story. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of your men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely erase the memory of the Amalekites from under heaven. So that was another promise that the Amalekites would be wiped out. Now we were also to read 1 Samuel chapter 15 for further insight, because it tells what happened later. Verse 1, Saul was king of Israel. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Now that was a very specific command. It was clearly spelled out. But this is how Saul responded. Saul went to the city of Amalek and attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and his army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, 
I am grieved that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was troubled and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul had gone to Carmel. When Samuel reached Saul, he said, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? And what is this lowing of cattle I hear? In other words, if the Lord's instructions had been carried out, there would have been no bleeding of sheep or lowing of cattle because God had told Saul to destroy everything belonging to the Amalekites. Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. Stop, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Samuel said, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission, saying, Go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on a mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as much as in obeying the word of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Samuel said, Bring me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Saul disobeyed God, and he refused to wipe out the Amalekites that God had told him to do. He spared Agag, king of the Amalekites, from whom Haman, the Agagite, was descended. But now, at the death of Haman, his sons, and other Amalekites, they are finally completely erased from under heaven as God had promised. The Amalekites were enemies of God, so this was God's judgment that Saul had failed to carry out. And this is an extremely important lesson for us because obedience is what the Lord wants. Obedience brings blessing, but disobedience brings discipline and often disaster. Because Saul disobeyed the word of the Lord, the Lord rejected him as king. So that's a warning to us. God's word is clearly spelled out in the Bible. Just as Saul disobeyed God's command, and kept some of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord. Sometimes we might sacrifice time or money or material things thinking that we're pleasing the Lord. But what he wants is for us to obey his word. To obey is better than sacrifice. Then question five, what did the Jews refrain from doing? Verse 10, they did not lay their hands on the plunder. How is that different from Saul's behavior in his battle against the same enemy, the Amalekites? In the story we just read, Samuel said in verse 19, Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? So unlike Saul, the Jews refrained from laying their hands on the plunder. Question 6, we were to read verses 11 through 14. Verse 11, 
The number of those slain in the citadel of Susa was reported to the king that same day. The king said to Queen Esther, The Jews have killed 500 men and the 10 sons of Haman in the citadel of Susa. What have they done to the rest of the king's province? Now what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? It will also be granted. If it pleases the king, Esther answered, give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged on gallows. So the king commanded that this be done. An edict was issued in Susa, and they hanged the ten sons of Haman. Question six, how did Haman's evil plan for Mordecai not only backfire on him, but at Esther's request, cause a similar fate for his sons? We were told in chapter five, verse 15, his wife, Zeresh, and all of his friends said to him, have a gallows built 75 feet high and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. But that plan backfired on him. Chapter 7, verse 10 says, they hanged Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. And not only that, at Esther's request, it caused a similar fate for his sons. Chapter 9, 14 says, an edict was issued in Susa, and they hanged the ten sons of Haman. And chapter 9, verse 25 says, when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. So Haman's evil plan for Mordecai to be hanged on the gallows not only backfired on him, but it caused a similar fate for his sons. And that wasn't the end of it. Question seven. How many more were killed, and again, what did the Jews refuse to do? Verse 15, the Jews in Susa came together on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they put to death in Susa 300 men, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies they killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. So once again, they refused to lay their hands on the plunder. Question eight, what did they do the following day? Verse 17, this happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th, they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. We can imagine the relief they felt to go from fear over being completely destroyed to having victory over their enemies and to once again be living in peace. What a celebration that must have been. And you know, it reminds us of what we Americans felt after World War II, after living with fear for our loved ones overseas who were fighting and the fear of possibly being attacked in our own country, the war was over and so now there was peace. So we celebrated and there was much joy. Purim is celebrated. Question nine, there was a difference in when the Jews celebrated. When did the Jews in Susa celebrate? Verse 18 says the 15th of the month of Adar. When did the Jews in the villages celebrate? Verse 19 says, the 14th of the month of Adar. Question 10, how did they celebrate? They celebrated with feasting, joy, and giving presents to each other. Question 11, what did Mordecai ask the Jews to celebrate? Verse 20, Mordecai recorded these events and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes near and far to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy 
and their mourning into a day of celebration. And question 12, how were they to observe the days? Verse 22, he wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. In question 13, what were the days of celebration to be called? Verse 26, they were called Purim from the word Pur. Question 14, why was that word chosen? Verse 24, for Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the pur, that is, the lot, for their ruin and destruction. So they had cast the pur to determine the day. Pur means lot. The casting of the lot, that is, several pebbles, was common in decision-making in those days. Now question 15, how does Purim proclaim the sovereignty of God? Proverbs 16, verse 33 says, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Now question 16, how often were the Jews to observe Purim? Verse 27, the Jews took it upon themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family, in every province, and in every city. And these days of Purim should never cease to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of them die out among their descendants. And you know, it is still celebrated today, every year. When I first decided on ESTA as the Bible study for this fall, I had hoped that the restrictions on the virus would be listed so that we could be meeting together and actually celebrate Purim. I was hoping that we could do that. Unfortunately, that wasn't possible, so I'm just going to share some of the facts about Purim with you. One source that I found online says that the book of Esther is read and the adults stamp their feet every time the name of Haman is mentioned. One of the women in our Bible study, Miriam Morrison, lived in a community where there was a large presence of Jews. And so she's attended many festivals and she's even taught a course on Jewish festivals. So she shared some information with me. She said, Purim is the Jewish holiday that commemorates the saving of the Jewish people from Haman. The day of deliverance is a day of feasting and rejoicing. It's held by exchanging gifts, enjoying food and drinks, giving gifts to the poor, and eating a celebratory meal. Because Haman had plotted to completely destroy them by casting a lot, Purim is also known as the Feast of Lots. And the time is set by the Jewish calendar. Customs including drinking wine or other alcoholic beverages, wearing masks and costumes, and having public celebrations. The Jews eat triangular pastries called Haman's Pockets or Haman's Ears. It's a sweet pastry dough that's rolled out cut into circles and filled with a poppy seed filling, which is then wrapped up into a triangular shape. Seeds and nuts are customarily eaten on Purim because the Talmud relates that Queen Esther ate only those foods in the palace since she had no access to kosher food. They also eat dumplings filled with cooked meat, chicken, or liver and served in soup. A dessert consisting of fried dough balls and vanilla custard is traditional also. There are lots of other foods and Miriam says they are all fabulous. 
you know, we can understand the significance of continuing to celebrate such an important event in the life of the Jews. Their deliverance, when Satan's plan to destroy them was overcome by the sovereignty of God. How do Christians celebrate God's deliverance in a similar way? Well, the day we Christians celebrate every year with joy, feasting, and giving of presents to each other is Christmas, when Jesus came to set us free. So question 17, how is the victory over death given to you by Jesus Christ's death on the cross reflected in your life? We know all too well that this world is full of sadness and evil, but despite that, do you possess a persistent spirit of joy and gratitude, even during the difficult times? We're going through a difficult time right now. It's unprecedented in the history of our nation. There is extreme sadness over the thousands of deaths brought about by the pandemic. And we have no idea how much longer it's going to last or how many more lives will be lost. But despite that, if you have experienced the new birth and are a child of God, you can still possess that spirit of joy and gratitude over God's deliverance. Victory over death that was given to us by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins. Nothing can ever take that away from us. The Lord is sovereign over all things, all places, all people, all the time. Next week, we'll be going over chapter 10. And it will be our last lesson, so I'd like to do something a little bit different. If you look at lesson 10, you'll see that other than question one, all of the questions are personal. So I'd like to have your input. I'd like for you to share some of the things that the Lord has taught you through his word over these last few weeks. Seeing what God's word says is just the first step. What is really important is how we apply it to our lives. So I'd like to see what your input is on some of these questions. Question two, what are some practical ways that you and I can help minorities or people of other races in our generation who are mistreated? Question three, how should we pray and act? Question four, how has this study helped you to better understand the sovereignty of God, how he works behind the scenes to get his will accomplished, the importance of prayer, the importance of waiting on God's timing, the necessity to accept people regardless of their nationality of race, the difference that one person can make in this world. But do you feel there's some role that God would have you fill in your home, your family, your neighborhood, your job, your church, and our country for such a time as this? If you'd be willing to share some of your thoughts and answers, please send them to me no later than this Saturday afternoon so that I'll have time to compile them. You can send one or you can send several. You can include your name or you don't need to. Either way is fine. If you're at the towers, you can put it in my mailbox. And if you're watching online, you can send me an email. I'm going to look forward to sharing some of those with you next week as we conclude our study of Esther. Let's close in prayer now. And Father, how we do thank you for the truths that you've revealed to us in this lesson. How the consequences of evil cause so much pain and sorrow. Just as Haman's evil caused pain and sorrow to his family, those closest to us are often hurt by the evil that we do. Thank you for the truth that the promises in your word are always fulfilled. Just as your promise to the Jews was fulfilled, that their enemies, the Amalekites, would be wiped out, you always fulfill your promises to us. Thank you for the truth that obedience to your word is what you want. 
Just as Saul's disobedience brought about your rejection of him as king, when we disobey, you discipline us. And thank you for the truth that just as the Jews rejoiced and celebrated God's victory over their enemies, no matter what we're going through, we can always possess a spirit of joy and gratitude over the victory over death you have given us through Jesus' death on the cross for our sins. Help us to apply these truths to our lives. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to next week when we will conclude with Chapter 10. Thank you.